And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And Joseph went out from the city of Nazareth unto the city which is called Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. Hello, I'm Peter Jennings, and we have been searching for Jesus. As reporters, that is, because it's an irresistible story. And whatever your faith or religion, there's simply no denying the extraordinary influence that Jesus has had, that he does have in people's lives. We've tried to be respectful about what people believe as we have gone in search of what we can know about Jesus, the man. We found a real person. We suspected that reliable sources would be hard to come by, and sometimes they were, as we found early on. We ended up one day at a news conference in a grove of olive trees just outside Bethlehem. We believe that this site can uh, be developed both as a touristic site and as a pilgrimage uh, site, a major pilgrimage site. The Israeli government archaeologists and the Greek Orthodox Church were announcing an important new discovery. They had uncovered a rock where they say Jesus' mother Mary, pregnant and tired, sat and rested on the road to Bethlehem. But speaking as an archaeologist, do you believe that Mary sat on that rock? I can assure you whether she sat exactly in this piece of uh, rock, but it, for sure it happened somewhere in the surroundings. Now, no one here could tell us where they got the information about Mary sitting on the rock, and there's nothing in the Bible about Mary sitting anywhere. What is your indication that this is the real place that the uh, Virgin uh, Maria rests. Right here we realized just how difficult it would be for a journalist to get the story right. It turned out that what the archaeologists had actually uncovered here was the foundation of a church with a big rock in the center. The church was built three or four hundred years after Jesus lived by converts to Christianity who'd come here and were told by the local people that this was where Jesus' mother supposedly sat down. We went into Bethlehem itself because we obviously wanted to hear what the local people there had to say about the birth of Jesus or about his parents, Joseph the carpenter and his pregnant fiance, Mary. When they saw her uh, belly was bigger and bigger, she, they asked her, from where that came? You are not married. She said it's the, uh, from the Spirit of God. The angel come from, mm -hmm. from the sky mm -hmm. and tell them that there's a baby born in Bethlehem. This man is from a little village down the road where he told us the angels appeared to announce Jesus' birth to some shepherds. Again, the only evidence this happened here is another church built about 400 years after Jesus lived. Do you believe the story? Why not? Because we are Christian. Why not? We must believe. Why not? And of course, we went to the enormous church of the Nativity, which sits at the very center of Bethlehem. This is the church where everybody thinks Jesus was born? Yes, sir. It's the real place where Jesus was born. Well, as far as anyone knows, for about 300 years after Jesus was born, there was nothing marking this as the site of the manger. For most of that time, there were no churches at all. Christians were being persecuted throughout the Roman Empire. 
until the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to the faith and sent his mother, Queen Helena, here to build churches. That's the place where Christ was born. The star is a symbol of the Star of Bethlehem, and it marks the holy place where Christ was born. And this cave used to be the stable. The local people apparently told Helena that this was the place where Mary laid the baby in a manger and where three kings or wise men knelt to worship him. And there is the altar where the three kings gave to Christ the Lord the three presents. And so this sprawling sanctuary tells us a lot about the enthusiasm of fourth century Christians, but not very much about the life of Jesus. One of the first things we learned when we started this was that all but the most skeptical historians believe Jesus was a real person, even though when you come here you do not find any physical evidence. What everybody starts with is this, the New Testament of the Bible. The New Testament provides us with bits and pieces about Jesus' life and most of it about the last couple of years. And so we took the book and we went to talk to biblical scholars and historians and archaeologists. Many of them are Christians, some of them are priests or ministers, others studied for years in seminaries. We also talked to Jewish experts, of course, because Jesus was a first century Jew. As we listened to these men and women, we came to realize that the debate about Jesus the man and his teachings is as vigorous and exciting today as it has been in any century. And the disagreements begin right at the beginning. Do you think there was a star in the East? I think the star is um, uh, purely legendary and symbolic. The shepherds may have been, uh, you know, relatives who were out in the fields and word was sent to them that a relative had a child and there was great rejoicing and they came back. I don't think it was angels. And I really don't think there were three wise men. Scholars told us early on that they don't take everything they read in the New Testament literally because the New Testament has four different and sometimes contradictory versions of Jesus' life. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is no reliable evidence about who the authors actually were. It is pretty much agreed that they were not eyewitnesses. In fact, the Gospels were probably written 40 to 100 years after Jesus' death. So reading the Gospels as part of the search for the historic life of Jesus, how much should I rely on them? <laughs> you can rely on them as the place to start, as the place where you know you're in touch with, this is what people really thought really happened. Of course, like any historical task, uh, the historian has to say, but how does this fit with everything else that's going on? Where does the archaeology come in? What about the other documents that aren't uh, in the New Testament? So scholars are very careful when they cite the Gospels. On the question of where Jesus was born, only two Gospels even talk about it, and they tell it differently. In Luke, of course, we have the famous story of them living in Nazareth but needing to go to Bethlehem for the census and that's why Jesus is born in a stable in a manger because there's no room in the inn. In Matthew, and this is one of the most striking differences, the family apparently lives in Bethlehem and Jesus is born at home. To get the whole nativity scene that we're all familiar with you have to put the two stories together. Only Luke has the shepherds and the angels and only Matthew has the kings and the star. Much of the information that we have about this part of the world in the first century does not support either gospel story. Take the gospel according to St. Luke. Luke writes that Joseph and Mary came here to Bethlehem from Nazareth because the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, had ordered a worldwide taxation. Now, there is no record outside the gospels that the emperor, Caesar Augustus, ordered such a tax. Roman tax records do show that a man is to be taxed where he lives and where he works, and Joseph lived and worked in Nazareth. Tax records also show they didn't count women. And so why would Joseph have brought Mary on this very difficult journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem through the desert, especially when she was very pregnant? In all likelihood, Jesus was born in Nazareth and not in Bethlehem. On what basis do you think he was born in Nazareth? The fact that Jesus is known as Jesus of Nazareth points very, very heavily to Nazareth being his birthplace. 
people in that world were known either as son of so-and-so or by the village in which they were born. We got two sides here. One commemorates the birthplace and one commemorates the major. But if Jesus wasn't born in Bethlehem, why would the gospel writers say that he was? A lot of scholars point to the Old Testament of the Bible. The Old Testament prophecies say that God would someday send a Messiah, a Jewish leader, to rid the world of violence and injustice. The gospel writers believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and the Old Testament says the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Look at that man, get another one. By the way, here's something else we learned very early on. Jesus scholars often disagree with each other even when they're looking at exactly the same evidence. As far as I'm concerned, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. If we only had Matthew's gospel, everyone would assume that Mary and Joseph were natives of Bethlehem. Father O'Connor dismisses Luke's story about the census and relies instead on Matthew's gospel. Matthew has the family fleeing Bethlehem and ending up in Nazareth after the local Jewish king Herod ordered that all the baby boys in Bethlehem should be massacred. Bethlehem was the most unfortunate village in the whole of the territory of Herod because it was named in a prophecy of the Old Testament as the place from which would come a warrior king. Now, as Herod's rule continued and he got older and sicker, violence began to bubble up. And so it became more repressive. His secret police were everywhere. So they were keeping a very close eye on Bethlehem, and anyone who stepped out of line, Herod would have demolished the whole village without any scruple. So everybody knew what could happen, and that's why Joseph decided, let's get out of here until the king dies. So this, it turns out, is what all the scholars do. They look at the stories and the other available evidence. They choose what they think makes the most sense historically, and then they make educated guesses. People are looking for mathematical or scientific proof. In history, that doesn't exist. What we're looking for is likelihood, possibility, plausibility, stuff like that. And in history, that's as far as you get, that's as good as you get. And when it comes to the birth narratives, no, I can't say it's even probable because it remains highly improbable that things like this happen. However, I know as a historian that history is full of things which were improbable at the time, and yet, my goodness, they happened. Why do you think Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Why, why here? Ah, this is uh, something, uh, why I born here, I don't know. We talked to people in Bethlehem about all this scholarly analysis, and they were not impressed. Where you born? You, Toronto. What? Canada. Canada. Mm -hmm. Canada. Why? Do you know, some scholars, some teachers, they think that Jesus was actually born in Nazareth. Where? Nazareth. Nazareth? No, he, he, he lived in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. He born here. He born here. Who tell you that is not correct? Here in Bethlehem. And for generations, people from all over the world have come to Bethlehem to celebrate the birth. One thing almost everyone we talk to agrees on is that the religious power of these stories, including the birth stories, doesn't depend on whether they can be verified. I do have this sense of, yes, I am reliving the birth of Jesus Christ again tonight. The Christmas Eve that we were in Bethlehem, we met the Pentecostals of America Choir who'd been invited to sing in Manger Square. The wise men, the wealthy, the king, the people that some of us will never be, the shepherds, the whole gauntlet of humanity was brought to his birth. These Americans, like many Christians all over the world, believe that Jesus is a divine being, 
sent here by God to die as a sacrifice for our sins. The truly faithful find a remarkable power in him. It is the man who inspired such astounding faith, such beautiful stories, who we were looking for. What really happened in this tiny corner of the world during the brief time that Jesus lived here? We kept looking and asking because something about being in this place, walking the same hills and roads that he did, standing at the sites people have venerated for centuries, it all gives you the strange feeling that maybe you can find the answers. If only you just look around the next corner, or the next one, or the next one. It seemed pretty clear to us that if we wanted to know more about Jesus' life, we had to head north for Nazareth. All four Gospels agree that Jesus grew up there. One gospel tells us that Jesus was the son of a carpenter, another that he was a carpenter himself. There's almost no trace of what was here in the first century. It was probably a tiny village with only a handful of houses. to the important churches in Nazareth. This one is supposed to mark the spot where Jesus' mother Mary became pregnant with him after a visit from an angel. People from Nazareth say this happened when Mary was playing with her friends at the town well, and that this is the well. The angel Gabriel carried the message to yeah. her that she is pregnant with Jesus Christ oh. here in this spot. Okay. In one of the most poetic passages in Luke's Gospel, the angel says to Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of God shall overshadow you. Therefore the holy child that shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. This story only appears in the Gospel of Luke. If it happened, the other Gospel writers don't mention it. We want to be clear before we go any further that we are very aware of our limitations. We cannot tell you whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. That is a matter of faith. But if you have difficulty with the idea that the Virgin 
Mary could get pregnant without a man involved, there are a number of ways to explain why in Luke it is written that way. In the first century, there's dozens of stories like that. They're all over Greek and Roman mythology. So what do I do? Do I believe all of those stories or do I say all of those stories are lies except for our Christian story? Some scholars say that the virgin birth story written after Jesus was crucified was intended as a challenge to Roman power in the region. It's very similar to a story told about Caesar Augustus. In his official biography, it says that Augustus's mother was made pregnant by the Greek and Roman sun god Apollo. His mother was in the temple of Apollo. She fell asleep during the night. She was impregnated by Apollo in the form of a snake. And therefore, of course, the child who was born was divine, Augustus. And of course, millions of people would have said in the first century, clear, look what he's done. He's brought peace to the warring empire. He's got rid of the, the civil wars. He's our man. Peacemaker, son of God. These are all titles of Caesar Augustus. Uh, Lord, when the same story is told of Mary concerning Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it means where do you find your God? Do you find God in pomp and power with Augustus? Or do you find God in a Jewish child, so poor, he didn't even have a home to be born in. That's really what's at issue in that story. Some scholars think that there's another issue, that Jesus was illegitimate, and the story was a cover-up. And the cover-up was, uh, if Jesus had been illegitimate, there would have been some effort to make it appear that he was not illegitimate, once, once he became a heroic figure. After the birth stories, Joseph pretty much disappears from the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, someone criticizing Jesus says no one knows who his father was. And an anti-Christian writer in the second century mentions a rumor that a Roman soldier made Mary pregnant. We don't know very much about Mary. We know that in the first century, women married and usually had children by the time they were 15. And so the woman who came to be revered in history as the Blessed Mother could well have been a teenager raising a child by herself. Here are the only things we can say with some certainty about the birth of Jesus. He was born Jewish at a time of great political tension. The Jewish people were living under Roman occupation, and some Jews actively resisted. When Jesus was a child, there was a Jewish uprising here, four miles from Nazareth, in a city called Sepphoris. The Romans responded in typical fashion. They destroyed the city, and anyone left alive became a slave. Jesus surely heard the stories of what the Romans did here at Sepphoris to the people who rebelled against them. After all, he didn't live very far away. That is the present-day city of Nazareth just snaking in across the hills over there. After Sepphoris was destroyed, the Romans appointed a 17-year-old Jewish boy to be their puppet governor here. His name was Herod Antipas. He was the son of King Herod the Great. And like his brothers, he'd been almost completely educated in Rome. Herod Antipas and Jesus the Jew had virtually nothing in common. But as Jesus was growing up here, Herod Antipas was rebuilding Sepphoris as his capital. The first century, by the way, is before our eyes. Look to the left. James Strange is an archaeologist and a Baptist minister. He is trying to piece together a picture of what King Herod Antipas and his city of Sepphoris represented while Jesus was growing up. You cannot write a history of Jesus as though he were from Long Island. You know, it just doesn't work. So you have to know this background, this setting, very, very thoroughly, and archaeology can provide that. What I do, I'm in, in charge of all the pottery wash. The people who work on these archaeological sites are mostly volunteers who spend their vacations doing this. The Jesus of the Gospel seems a lot more personal. It takes him out of the hero mythology realm and, and puts him in a personal, person-to-person -person kind of realm. Jesus and his family over here in Nazareth are looking 
and they come up over the hill at a great city on the hillside, which can't be hid, <laughs> and it looks Roman. So as a young boy, all Jesus had to do was to come over here to the city that Herod Antipas built to see an imposing physical reminder of Roman power. But Herod Antipas is Jewish. Yeah, yeah, he's Jewish. I don't think he knows anything about it because he's been living in Rome, being trained to be a Roman, basically. His father, it's kind of like sending your kid to Switzerland or something, and you forget then that they don't know your local culture. And I think that's what happened to Antipas. Here in Sepphoris, Jesus could have seen how Herod Antipas and his rich friends lived in stark contrast to people in tiny villages such as Nazareth. To pay for all this, it appears that Herod Antipas taxed his fellow Jews heavily, keeping the peasants in abject poverty. Peasant existence was really quite desperate. Um, infant mortality rates were about 30%. Um, 30% uh, of children would die before age one. Another 30% or so would die by age six, so 60% of all children are dead by age six. If you made it to age six and you were a peasant, your life expectancy would be approximately 25 to 30 years. Now, people we call the elites, meaning the top two to four percent of the population, their life expectancy was between 60 and 70 years. The point being that peasant life in Galilee in the first century was very tough. Was very, very tough. Was between 60 and 70 years. The point being that peasant life in Galilee in the first century was very tough. Was very, very tough. In the back streets of Nazareth, Jesus could have heard people talking about how God would intervene before long to replace Herod Antipas and the Roman occupation with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a political term. The kingdom of God is a political term? Right. The kingdom in the first century meant Augustus's kingdom, the, the Roman, Roman Empire, kingdom. the Roman Empire. If you say the kingdom of God, you are speaking once again in your face, Caesar. This is the way God wants the world run. So when Jews in Jesus' time talked about God's kingdom, they weren't talking about a place you went after you died. They envisioned a kingdom of God right here on earth. Is it reasonable or possible for the average guy on the street in the first century to have a general notion about this? I think so. What would it be? I think it would, the kingdom of God would mean when um, God, the king of the universe, God, the king of Israel, it's the same person, um, will have overthrown evil once for all. You have no disease, you have uh, no starvation, you have, you have hills running with milk and honey, and you have peace. Not very practical. Um, it would take a miracle, but that's what these people were expecting. When Jesus was 10 or 12 years old, there was another violent Jewish revolt here. The revolutionary slogan was, no king but God. The rebellion was put down brutally by the Romans. They brought in the legions and crucified probably hundreds of those revolutionaries, those kingdom people, uh, in and around the places where Jesus knew when he was growing up. So Jesus grew up almost literally under the shadow of the cross. He knew that this was what happened to kingdom people. So by the time he was a teenager, Jesus would have lived through two failed Jewish rebellions. And he would have heard the ancient Jewish prophecy saying that God would someday send a Messiah to establish his kingdom on earth. The word Messiah did not mean the son of God. It simply meant the anointed one. There were plenty of people who really seemed to have believed that they were the Lord's anointed and that God was going to work through them to bring about the great turnaround in Israel's fortunes that everyone was wanting. So it's not at all unusual for a boy in Jesus' time to think something's really got to be done here and possibly I'm the one to do it. Something's got to be done. Maybe I'll be the one to do it. And maybe I'm the Messiah? I suspect that half the Jewish mothers in Galilee at the time hoped that their son was going to be the Messiah. There is no description in the Bible of what Jesus actually looked like. What do you think he looked like? Blue eyes, 
sort of lighter skin. He was a perfect <laughs> man, six foot tall, blue eyes. What color eyes do you think he had? Blue. Was he tall or short, do you think? Like your size. My size? Yes. yes. that the average height of a male in that world was about five feet or five feet one inch. Average weight, maybe 110 pounds. He is dark and swarthy. He is Eastern Mediterranean type. I picture him as uh, very Mediterranean and very intense. A combination of Pacino and De Niro. He is bearded. And that doesn't mean a nice trim beard. That means he doesn't shave. Why has he got a beard in your mind's eye. Because it takes time and money to shave. That's a luxury. I take it for granted that being a peasant, he would not shave. But whatever Jesus looked like, it wasn't that sort of dreamy pre-Raphaelite Victorian watercolor Jesus. Um, if you want to know something of what Jesus looked like, go down the road from Jerusalem and see a chap coming in from the desert with his head in a scarf and so on, with his eyes half shut against the desert sand and his face and his neck and his arms baked by the sun. And that's probably the first image that you or I would have of Jesus if we were to meet him today. By the time Jesus had reached his late 20s, another Kingdom of God movement was gathering momentum in Palestine. Jesus headed out into the Judean desert to find the group, which was led by a man called John the Baptist. John the Baptist was that kind of a fire and brimstone person who apparently um, announced that the end was coming soon, uh, kind of like the end of the millennium people around us today who may be parading with placards and so forth. God is coming soon, the end is at hand and so forth, the kingdom is coming. Most historians say that Jesus would have found John the Baptist preaching to crowds of people somewhere about here on the banks of the Jordan River. Today, the site is in a closed military zone on the Israeli-Jordanian border. John the Baptist uh, must have been a very interesting character, and even the film versions of the life of uh, Jesus um, often present him as a wild and crazy guy, and he may well have been like that. The sacrifice God demands is a repentant heart. Get the road ready for the Lord. Repent! John said that what God required was for Jews to repent their sins. Washing themselves in the river was a way of showing they had cleansed their souls for God. Wash away your sins. He was an eccentric character, John. He wore camel skins and ate bugs and wild honey. He was a sharp critic of King Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas feared John's influence with the people. Jesus left uh, the comfort of his uh, family home, such as it was, and he went out and joined with this very impolite movement. I mean, John was out there in the wilderness saying some very nasty things about some of the leading citizens of Israel. At Easter time, we paid a visit to Alexandria, Louisiana, not Egypt because the Pentecostals we'd met in Bethlehem invited us down to their church. They wanted us to see an extravaganza they put on every year about the life of Jesus. Repent! Next to Jesus himself, John the Baptist has the biggest part. John the Baptist was the wild prophet who emptied synagogues and the religion of that day, and of course took on the establishment. John is played by a computer science instructor at the local community college. He looks and acts just like scholars describe the John of history. And every tree that bears not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. 
Here, John the Baptist is actually criticizing the priests who run the temple in Jerusalem, the absolute center of Jewish life and law. The priests were appointed by the Romans who expected the priests to keep the peace. They were aristocrats who had grown rich off the temple treasury. There's a bit in Luke about the, uh, about the brood of vipers. Exactly, the brood of vipers. And who was he talking to when he's referring to He was to talking the to the priest. He was talking to uh, the leaders of the synagogue. They were missing the needs of the people. The Lord said, my ways are not your ways. When Jesus went out into the desert looking for John, it appears he was doing what many young, restless men of his generation were doing. Were there a lot of people wandering around the countryside who were dissatisfied with the way the temple was being run? I think so. Every source that we have about the first century, we found people which are unsatisfied with what's happening, that have a criticism about what's happening, that feel that the corrupt establishment is running the temple. Hanan Eshel is an expert on another group of Jews who are unhappy with the Jewish establishment. This place is called Qumran, in the desert, not far from Jerusalem, you can still see the caves they carved out of the cliffs. John the Baptist is active. You can see it now in the area where the Jordan River fall into the Dead Sea. Right. And I think that some of them knew of this group. They were part of the same movement. They were all young. When archaeologists found a cemetery here, almost everyone in it was under 30. In a way, you can compare them to uh, the 60s, when people left and decided to look for a better, better society living in different uh, different society that they created. And we know about this group because in 1947, shepherds chasing their goats found some ancient documents here, which we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The scrolls tell us that the people living here were preparing for the Messiah, just like John and his group. They believe that God's final judgment, the apocalypse, was just around the corner. The young people here would all be enlisted as soldiers in the Messiah's army. To be a great battle between the forces of good and evil, and the righteous would be raised from the dead. All of them had this desire to lead the temple, to lead the Jewish people, and to change the situation. The apocalyptic solution, let us call it, was one of the many solutions in that first century. If this world is clearly an unjust, unrighteous place, which it was for many people in the first century, and your God's supposed to be just and righteousness, when's he going to do something about it? <laughs> surely any day now, surely next week, next month, next year, God is going to descend with the angels from heaven and restore this world to complete justice and holiness. Today, about an hour's drive from the historic site in the minefield, Christian pilgrims come by the busload to be baptized, as Jesus was, in the River Jordan. Thomas, do you wish to renew your baptismal commitment? Elizabeth, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I acknowledge... You can rent a robe if it helps. For your glory and your name's sake, Father. Hallelujah. Yeah. The Gospels give different versions of what happened on the day that Jesus was baptized. In one Gospel, John the Baptist actually heard a voice and saw the Holy Spirit. And based on this, John told everybody that Jesus was the Messiah. Yes, beautiful. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Gospel according to Mark, which was probably the first one written, makes no mention of others hearing a voice or seeing the Holy Spirit. Mark says only that Jesus saw the sky opening when he came up out of the water. All the Gospels do agree that this meeting with John marked the end of Jesus' life as an obscure peasant from Nazareth. Now he was involved in something radical, radical and dangerous. In a very short time, these two young men who had stood face to face in the Jordan River would both be executed.
The Gospels tell us that sometime after his meeting with John the Baptist, Jesus went off by himself to spend 40 days meditating and fasting in the desert. We do know that people can indeed fast for 40 days or more, as long as they have water. The Gospel stories also say that during this time, Jesus was tempted by the devil. We also know that fasting brings about uh, alterations in consciousness. Which is about as speculative as historians want to get when discussing the meeting with the devil. What does seem clear from the Gospels is that after spending time in the desert, Jesus headed back north to the Sea of Galilee, and so we headed there as well. The sea is actually a large lake which flows into the Jordan River on the border with Syria. The Gospels say that Jesus came here after Herod Antipas had put John the Baptist in prison. What would have been the population around here in the first century? There were a whole string of little villages around the lake, each one with perhaps a population of, say, four or 500 maximum. And is this where Jesus, you think, first tried to make his mark as a preacher? Yes, that he had been preaching as an assistant to John in the south. He came north after John was arrested because he was now head of the Baptist movement. The Gospels depict Jesus moving from village to village, gathering followers from among the fishermen here preaching what he must have known was a dangerous message. What he talked about is the kingdom of God. That's what most scholars, 99.9% .9 scholars will tell you, that's what we're sure about. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. And when he would talk about God's reign and God's kingdom, God's empire, this is language that is potentially explosive because it has political overtones. And there must have been a lot of people, maybe some ears around the corner, in fact, that were listening too. This is the kingdom movement, which means king of the Jews, Oh, wait a minute, there is a king of the Jews mm. just up the street. Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas. And he doesn't enjoy having rival kings around. And Herod Antipas, the local king, had a way of dealing with people who preached about the kingdom of God. As Jesus was beginning his ministry, Herod Antipas cut off John's head. This potential danger may be why Jesus is described in the Gospels as moving around all the time. He seems to have spent a lot of time here in a town called Bethsaida. It was just outside the territory of Herod Antipas. This was in the territory of Trachonitis. That's not a disease. Right. It's, it's a, it was a place. Right. <laughs> and um, so he, 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 this would have been uh, outside of Herod Antipas. He wouldn't have been reachable here. Elizabeth McNamer has led the group of volunteers who've been excavating at Bethsaida. It was a boarded town, and it seems to me that any time Jesus himself felt threatened, he would just hop over the border. It was safer here. Yes, yes, yes. Read in Luke, after the beheading of John the Baptist, where did he go? To Bethsaida. But what would he have been afraid of? Well, I suppose afraid of losing his own head. It must have been a real challenge for Jesus to get his message across without inciting the authorities. That is probably why he told little stories which were symbolic and subversive. In the parable of the mustard seed, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it grows, it becomes a shrub where birds can make their nests. Now this is a mustard shrub, so you can see that Jesus is not really describing a beautiful paradise filled with lovely trees. A mustard plant is actually a nasty weed. Watch out for mustard. <laughs> if it gets into your your fields, you may not be able to control it. So the kingdom of God is likened to a very weird thing. It's useful, but it's dangerous. Uh, we know that the parable of the mustard seed is not gardening advice. He is speaking about the real world out there, telling a story, uh, but he doesn't mean literally what he says. And when Jesus was asked to define this and describe this, he never quite gets around to that. And he tells stories and kind of hints around at this and hints at that and, and plays games with people. It's a way of saying, you're not going to catch me out. I'm going to tease you with this and then 
I'll leave you puzzling it out and I'll be on in the next village before you can come back. Think how revolutionary these words must have sounded to the struggling peasants of the Galilee. Blessed are the poor, the kingdom of God belongs to you. Blessed are you who hunger now, you shall be filled. And this, woe to you who are full now, you shall be hungry. The people in his audience would have little trouble imagining who Jesus was talking about. Remember, in the Galilee, we think there were just a handful of wealthy families, Herod Antipas and his circle, who were getting rich while the peasants were being taxed off their lands. In fact, if you were a first century Galilean peasant, a lot of what Jesus said would probably have meant something very different to you than it does to us today. Most people, when they hear this phrase about turning the other cheek, they think it means basically that you've got to be a doormat for Jesus, to be a wimp, just to lie down and take whatever comes to you. Tom Wright is talking about the passage where Jesus says, if someone slaps you on your right cheek, offer him your left. In, the, in those days, people in that culture only ever used their right hand for doing anything in public. And so to hit somebody on the right cheek would involve hitting somebody with the back of the hand. And hitting somebody with the back of the hand is demeaning. It says you're an inferior and I'm dismissing you and I'm treating you as a piece of dirt. But then if the person who is hit turns the other cheek, the, the, the left cheek, the only way that you can hit the left cheek with the right hand is with uh, a blow like that. You can't do it with the back of your hand, you twist your arm out of shape. And to hit somebody like that is a very different thing socially and culturally. Instead of saying, you're an inferior, you're a piece of dirt, it's saying, you're my equal and I have to regard you as a fellow human being. So that turning the other cheek cuts the aggressor down to size. You may still get hurt, you may still be knocked unconscious, but you cut the aggressor down to size and you bring the person who is in the position of weakness back up to human dignity again. What the Gospels don't say, but other historical documents tell us, is that Jesus, along with John the Baptist and the warrior monks of the Dead Sea sect, were just three of many different groups within Judaism with different ideas of what to do to bring about God's kingdom on earth. Now stop for a second and think again about first century Palestine. Jesus, John the Baptist, the people of Qumran, and others advocating violence within Judaism were all preaching against the power of the authorities. It was a very turbulent time. Many, many Christians believe that Jesus planned to start a new religion. True? No. Jesus was part of many movements within the first century Judaism which were trying to resist the military imperialism of Rome one more group elbowing one another, to be sure, for the leadership of their people. Starting a new religion? No. That's not what anyone is thinking of. Your description of Jesus, your analysis of Jesus, is very much as a political figure. You couldn't distinguish those in the first century. Politics and theology, religion and economics, were totally, inextricably intertwined. What Jesus is then saying is, Yes, this is the time when all that stuff is going to be fulfilled, but it's going to look significantly different from how you think because of who God actually is, and the God that you actually have is not a God who's going to blast everyone else to smithereens with your revolution. The Gospel stories describe Jesus impressing his followers by performing supernatural feats, walking on water, turning water into wine, and feeding thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. But most scholars we talk to think these stories were invented by the Gospel writers as advertisements for Christianity in its early years. Christianity, after all, was competing for followers with Judaism and with Greek and Roman pagan religions. 
Moses feeds a multitude in the wilderness, just as Jesus feeds a multitude in the wilderness. Jesus walks on the water, just as the Greek god Poseidon rides his chariot over the water. That's his miracle. Jesus changes water into wine, just as the Greek god Dionysus, as his chief miracle, changes water into wine. And the message of the New Testament Gospels really is that Jesus can do the same kind of good stuff that Poseidon and Dionysus can do. So those stories really are adopted then and adapted to the figure of Jesus. But many scholars do believe the Gospels when they say that as he moved from village to village preaching, Jesus also healed and drove demons out of people. In the first century, sick people were thought to be possessed by evil spirits. Did Jesus really heal people? This is one of the more interesting of the issues that, that scholars face. And sometimes uh, scholars uh, who are embarrassed by televangelists and by exorcisms and healings on a stage or on television might shy away from uh, these kinds of accounts. The fact of the matter is we have lots of stories of healings and exorcisms uh, in the New Testament and early Christian literature, and we've got to face those uh, in an honest and uh, forthright kind so of fashion. So go ahead, do that for me. Did um, Jesus, I'll, I'll try. Did Jesus you see, I'm, I'm bluffing here. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get away from it just as my colleagues do. But did Jesus really heal people, and how did he go about it? My, my hunch is this. Um, I think that Jesus uh, was understood to be a faith healer and an exorcist. There is a world in the first century that we may not know much about, a world of magic, a world of exorcism, a world of healing. That was a very important world for many people, many of the ordinary folks. This is where the religious rubber hit the road. Uh, what can your religion do for me, people said, in terms of my um, illnesses? my diseases, my hurts, my children who have died. What can religion do for me in that case? The reason that scholars believe Jesus was able to heal people in some cases is that doctors believe it. In my field, which is rheumatology, aches and pains, uh, a large dimension of dealing with these problems is the, the psychiatric dimension. The psychiatric when we met Dr. Patrick Whalen from Harvard University, he was spending his vacation at the Bethsaida excavation. Somebody comes into the doctor and oftentimes we can't do anything but reassure them this is not going to get worse, this will not threaten your life. And their suffering is immensely eased by that, by depriving them of the anxiety and the fear component of the pain. And then their pain is easier to bear. People are coming to him in order to have demons driven away, in order to be cured um, of illness. And while he's doing this, um, he says something like, you see what's happening, the blind see, the lame walk. This means that the kingdom of God is, is occurring. It's about to break in. So did people believe Jesus, particularly because of his healings? Oh, imagine yourself in the crowd. If somebody who had suffered from blindness could suddenly see, how would you feel about what he was saying? Bethsaida was one of the places where Jesus reportedly healed people, and some of his closest followers were from here. Recently, archaeologists here have found what they think is evidence that Jesus was attracting not just the impoverished, but also members of quite well-to-do families. Peter, Andrew, and Philip came from here. And Luke tells us that uh, James and John were partners in the fishing business with them. So they all came from here. In Bethsaida, archaeologists have revealed large houses. If you look at that kitchen over there, for instance, it oh, had what? two ovens, yes. A two-oven family was a, yes. was a pretty well-off family. I mean, family. you know, it's like two microwaves. How many, <laughs> many houses have two microwaves today? Well, I do, actually, but uh, I'm an exception rather than the rule. Okay, so this kitchen here doesn't look very big, but it did have two ovens. Now, why did you need two ovens? Does it mean this person here entertained a great deal? Sometimes the smallest clue opens a door. They found a wine cellar here with wine jars from the Greek island of Rhodes. From okay. Rhodes in yes. the Mediterranean, yes. which is yes. several hundred miles yes, from here. absolutely. Here's a piece of ribbon pot pot pottery. The point I'm making is that the person who lived in this house imported his wine. You know, how many poor people in America are importing wine from France? This came a long way. It was expensive. So whoever lived here wasn't, as I say, living on the edge.
It is unclear how welcome Jesus was in Bethsaida. In two of the Gospels, he curses the town, saying they don't appreciate him. He must have been a controversial figure, preaching about a kingdom where the well-off might lose everything, luring away sons of respectable families, and what's more, leading them to mix with all sorts of unsavory people. A woman named Mary Magdalene signs on, often depicted down through the centuries as a prostitute. And tax collectors, too, despised for skimming a healthy percentage of the money they took in. Jesus, it seems, lived his message of mercy for the outcasts of society. What do the enemies of Jesus say? He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. We're going to call them, like you might in the, in the 50s here, commies. We're going to call them tax collectors and sinners, which is like all one word for the nasties. What did Jesus' family think of his ministry? As far as we can gather from the Gospels, they disapproved of it. I mean, the only comment attributed to his family, which includes his mother and his brothers, is that uh, he's out of his mind in Mark chapter 3. They want to get him away from the crowds. They feel he's an embarrassment to the family. And so Jesus stays with those who are listening to him and says to those around him, you are my mother and my brothers and sisters. The most dramatic example of Jesus mixing with the outcasts of society is in the stories about people with leprosy, a skin disease believed to be contagious. The lepers were people with this disease that were put outside the city. They were moved from their families. There may be a father or a child or a mother that has leprosy that have to go live in this colony. Their food being brought to them and left then the people that brought the food would leave. Then the lepers could come to where the food was. Jesus would be walking along a road, according to the Gospels, and hear lepers calling to him in right. the distance. And he would do what? Well, what the lepers should be calling is so he can't approach, so he keeps away from them. What Jesus does is touch them, which means technically he is now unclean as they are. And the most powerful, powerful point of Scripture is Jesus reaches down, goes against the establishment, and touches a leper, which was forbidden. I think that he was bringing hope to the leper and said, these days are over. I've come to heal this kind of people. After Jesus had been preaching in the villages of the Galilee for a year or two, he set out to take his kingdom message to the very center of Jewish life, Jerusalem. Every year on Palm Sunday, a week before Easter, Christians from all over the world gather in Jerusalem to commemorate the arrival of Jesus just before his death. Jesus had come to the city for the Jewish high holiday of Passover. The Gospels say that he rode in on a donkey, greeted by crowds waving palm branches and hailing him as the Messiah. But apparently Jewish travelers always erupted in celebration when they arrived in Jerusalem for Passover. They may have been singing and shouting, but not necessarily for Jesus. Once they hit the top of the Mount of Olives, they would see the temple below them. There would be an explosion of joy, dancing, singing, hence the, you know, the triumphal element of the story. What was the status of Jesus's movement at this point. Did he, did he have a great many followers? I don't think he had. I think at the beginning there was a wave of enthusiasm, but he failed to meet their expectations. He wasn't going to do anything about the Romans, and he wasn't going to do anything about the landlords, and he was associating with tax collectors and sinners. And when we talk about the number of followers he might have had, how many might that have been? 10, 15, 20. That's all? Those who came with him. Maybe there were others 
who were hopeful but uncommitted in Galilee. But a very small number. And then you should imagine a group of young men and women walking against the walls of Jerusalem, armed with nothing but faith. And why would Jesus have wanted to come to Jerusalem? Every prophet goes where the levers of power are. You see, no prophet ever wasted his breath in Galilee. Change Galilee, you don't change Jerusalem, but if you change Jerusalem, there's a chance you will change Galilee. Everyone agrees that Jesus came to Jerusalem for Passover, and that by the end of the week, the young preacher from Nazareth was dead. But who wanted him executed? The Jewish priests or the Romans? And what did he do to attract their attention? First, you have to understand the Romans. Pontius Pilate, the military governor, brought extra troops down to Jerusalem for Passover every year. The Passover holiday always made them nervous. There had been demonstrations in the past. Passover is the holiday when Jews commemorate the time that God liberated their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. The celebrations lasted a week. Pilate's soldiers watched the crowded streets for troublemakers. And the Gospels say that Jesus waded right into the middle of this and started preaching. Does Pontius Pilate notice him? He's probably somebody he keeps his eye on because a crowd collects. If you're a Roman colonial governor, you want to watch it when the natives start collecting crowds. There were probably standing orders from Pilate. Anyone who raises their head, anyone who does anything subversive, dangerous, hit him and hit him hard. And crucify him and hang him out there as a warning. I can imagine Pilate saying, I'm not going to have any trouble this Passover. Moreover, according to the Gospels, Jesus was upsetting the Jewish authorities as well. The Jewish priests who ran the temple were getting rich, taking in money from pilgrims who came to the temple to atone for their sins. And on that Passover, according to three of the Gospels, Jesus walked into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers. And he is a marked man from then on, even if he wasn't before, which he may have been, because word definitely gets back to the chief priests. There's a prophet in town who's doing things in the temple. Put yourself in the position of the high priest in the temple. Jesus is in town. He's preaching. What are you worried about? What I would be worried about is that there might be a public disturbance at Passover which would lead to the intervention of troops, which might lead to several thousands of people being killed. The first century Jewish historian Josephus writes that Pontius Pilate ordered Roman soldiers to massacre many people on several occasions when there was trouble in Jerusalem. And what role do you think that the, uh, that the leaders of the temple have at this point? That's a miserable job, being the go-between government. The priests have the unhappy responsibility of trying to keep the Jewish crowds quiet on the one side and keeping the Roman governor calm on the other side. It's their city. They know how to move around Jerusalem. They help Pilate get Jesus. The way I imagine it is that they know that Pilate is getting nervous about the crowds around Jesus, and they, they do an intercept. They say, no, don't do what you usually do when you get nervous and upset. Not at Passover. Look, we can get you this guy. Promise you won't hurt anybody else. And Pilate says, okay, but you get him to me fast. The Gospels say that the night before he died, Jesus gathered his followers together and ate the traditional Passover dinner. What do you think that Last Supper was like? I think it was a rather stressful meal. 
uh, men and women. And then Jesus made this extraordinary announcement. This is my body and this is my blood. And he also says, I'm not going to drink wine again until I drink it in the kingdom. He's still expecting it to come, maybe that night. The night of Passover would be a good night for the Messiah to show up and the kingdom of God to show up. Today, the Last Supper is reenacted in a church ritual called the Eucharist, and Jesus' words as they appear in the Gospels are often interpreted as his prediction that he would die and that his death would be a sacrifice so that the sins of each of us would be forgiven. Scholars say this is probably not what it meant to Jesus. The idea of the forgiveness of sins for Jews is a much, much bigger thing. Forgiveness of sins meant that God would finally release Israel from the sins which had caused all this trouble. So forgiveness of sins had to do with release from their political and theological slavery. What he is quite clearly saying at the supper is, Israel's history is reaching its all-important dramatic climax. It is focused on me and my work. Israel's history's climax will involve my suffering and death very soon. Historians differ about what happened at the Last Supper. Some people think the whole speech about his body and blood at that meal was added by the Gospel writers. It doesn't happen in the Gospel of John, for example. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, why, why on earth does, does, does this not happen in John? Did, did he forget it as it were? And if it was so important, how can he leave it out? Whatever happened to the Last Supper, it does seem logical that under the circumstances, Jesus would have understood that he was in danger. After the meal, the Gospels say that Jesus and his disciples left the city and headed toward the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley. Now, the Kidron Valley has one most obvious characteristic. It's a huge graveyard. Now, a little bit off the picture to the left is the tomb of the Bene Hazir. Father O'Connor gives a lecture to Catholic seminary students about what he believes happened to Jesus in the Kidron Valley that night. And this is a tomb which is called the Tomb of the Pharaoh's Daughter. So that even in the first century, when Jesus walked up through the Kedron Valley, he was in fact walking through a huge, well-known graveyard. Seeing those great tombs in the moonlight, it suddenly hit him. It might be tonight. I might die tonight. I might die now. The Gospels tell us that the men climbed up the other side of the valley and stopped in a place on the Mount of Olives called Gethsemane. Here under the olive trees, the Gospels say that Jesus fell on the ground and began to pray. Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. The whole instinct of self-preservation took over. The oldest level of the story, which is found in Mark, says, Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. There he began to be deeply shocked and appalled. They depict a person on the edge of a complete breakdown, psychic and physical, through fear. The personality is coming apart under terror. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father O'Connor thinks he sees evidence that Jesus could have escaped if he had wanted to. Originally, this was a very ancient staircase, you see, and this is the easiest spot to climb the Mount of Olives. Even today, you have three roads going up to the top from this point. So if he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the authorities in some fashion were coming across the valley to get him, he could have escaped? Oh, yeah. All he had to do was stay ahead of them. Ten minutes would have brought him to the top of the Mount of Olives. Another 20 minutes fast walking along the ridge would have brought him to Bethany. There he would have picked up food and water and then off into the desert. They'd never have found him. Today, Gethsemane is a sanctuary. Inside, there's a beautiful old grove of olive trees with roots that go back to the time when Jesus lived. 
We had to protect the trees because uh, the devout pilgrims would uh, strip them of all their olive branches. <laughs> Father Edward Dillon from Lynbrook, New York, was in charge of the church when we were there, where, the Gospels say, a detachment of armed men finally caught up with Jesus. They could have seen down from the hill here that there were men coming with torches and swords and clubs. So they saw them going. And so I believe that Jesus said, come on, let's go. And he walked right into it, went down, in fact, to meet them. We go this way. Okay. And down the hill is a cave where Father Dillon says they arrested Jesus. Today, there's a chapel inside. So he said, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And his disciples all fled, <laughs> leaving him, as it were, flat. They were scared to death, you know. <laughs> That's what happened. All the Gospels say that one of his disciples, a man named Judas, led the guards to Jesus. In three of the Gospels, Judas identifies Jesus by kissing him. Probably a fiction because Judas looks to many of us like uh, the representation of uh, Judaism or the Jews as responsible for his death. If it is a fiction, it was one of the most cruel fictions that was ever invented. Do you believe that this was written into the Gospels in order to portray the Jews as having participated in his death? Yes. This is why you just call it such a cruel fiction? Yes. Well, th it's, it's because of the... Uh, untold uh, hostility that has persisted between Christians and Jews all down through the centuries. The story of Judas is terribly controversial. Was it simply made up uh, as a story? Some scholars think it was made up in order to be anti-Semitic, that Judas was sort of the typical quintessential Jew. Because Judas meant Jew. Yes. The trouble is, of course, that that was not the way people in the first century would have heard it, because that was an ordinary name. There's a lot of evidence that somebody, I mean, deliberately putting this very vaguely, somebody close to Jesus betrayed him. There's an intense debate about whether Jesus was put on trial by Jewish priests, as the Gospels indicate. In Mark, we have two Jewish trials, one at night and one first thing in the morning, and we have the same thing in Matthew. In Luke, we have only one Jewish trial, just in the morning. In John, we have no Jewish trial at all. Okay, so we don't have any clear evidence about Jewish trials per se. Some people argue the trial couldn't have happened because the priests would never have held a trial on Passover. Religious law prohibits work of any kind on the Sabbath. On the other hand, there are Jewish documents which describe the priests turning in fellow Jews to the Romans on other occasions. Is it possible that the Roman leadership alone would have arrested him and executed him? It is clear that he was executed on the order of Roman authority because crucifixion was a punishment inflicted only by the Romans. Uh, and it's possible that it was only Roman authority involved, but I and the majority of contemporary scholars, including Jewish scholars, would say that most likely a very narrow circle of the Jewish ruling elite centered in the temple, whose responsibility was domestic uh, peace, if you will, uh, were involved as collaborators with the Roman governor. In every version of the story, the Jewish leaders take Jesus to the Roman military governor, Pontius Pilate, and have to pressure him before he will pass the sentence. Many historians don't believe it. The conventional Christian wisdom, I think that's the way to put it, say that the Jews put him on trial and forced Pontius Pilate to crucify him. The conventional Christian wisdom usually forgets the situation. Pilate is running the country. We have evidence other than the Gospels for Pilate. Josephus talks about him as um, a thug, a really, you know, in a string of bad governors, he was one of the worst. Philo of Alexandria, who is Jesus' contemporary, um, writes that Pilate was known for his theft 
Yeah, his venality and his execution of untried prisoners. Jesus fits into that category without effort. The only element of the crucifixion story confirmed by a source outside the Gospels, by the Roman historian Tacitus, is this. It is Pilate who finally condemns Jesus. I think what Pilate's actually doing is addressing Jesus' followers. This is a very, very effective way of saying, calm down, guys. The kingdom of God isn't coming this Passover. Because people would have gone to bed all excited about the approach of the kingdom and Jesus' authority to announce it. And when they woke up the next morning, Jesus would have been you know, on his way to the cross. Well, maybe. But the stark truth is we don't know if more than a handful of people paid much attention to Jesus' execution. There are scholars who believe that Jesus didn't generate very much enthusiasm in Jerusalem. Uh, I think that the Romans executed him probably summarily without a trial at all, uh, just because he was a public nuisance. So do you therefore believe that in his time, in his day, at, in that place, he was a rather minor character? Yes. You do? Mm -hmm. By your definition then, Jesus is not an heroic figure at all until he gets into the hands of all the people who are going to write and embellish about him afterwards. No, I don't think that's right. correct. Okay. See, I think he was an heroic figure. Uh, Jesus was heroic in the sense that he died for the integrity of his vision. He was unwilling to compromise. It never occurred to him to look out for himself. He didn't ask anything for himself, so far as we can tell. He didn't even ask his followers uh, to do anything in particular. That's a heroic figure. Crucifixion was an ugly process. Crucifixion was the most horrible form of torturing and killing that the Romans had been able to devise, and they were pretty good at that kind of stuff. It meant right across the Roman world, we Romans run this show, and anyone who gets in our way gets rubbed out and rubbed out horribly. What's the charge? Well, the official charge, of course, is uh, that he's a political rebel against Rome. Treason. It is, exactly. So Jesus was executed not for blasphemy, as the Gospels indicate, but as a political revolutionary, a threat to the established political and social order. If we don't understand why he could be executed, then we miss the political passion that animated his mission. In a sense, he gave his life for the least of these. And when we turn the story of Jesus instead into uh, the eternal sacrifice for sin that makes our forgiveness possible, then we really set aside that which mattered so much to him, namely the poor, the untouchables, uh, the suffering of people in the world. Two thousand years later, Christian pilgrims still come to Jerusalem on Easter and commemorate the day that Jesus was led through the streets to the place of his execution, carrying his own cross. What killed Jesus? is the same dynamic that has been responsible for the martyrdom of um, Martin Luther King, of Gandhi. What Jesus was opposing was the normal discrimination, injustice, of normal human life. Jesus, if we're willing to face it, if he was among us today saying the same sorts of things and doing the same sorts of things, he would not be executed, but he would probably be assassinated. The Gospels say that Jesus hung on the cross for a few hours before dying. 
we assume of suffocation, since the idea behind crucifixion was that your lungs collapse under the weight of the hanging body. The Gospel stories don't end with Jesus' death. They say that afterward, Jesus is taken down off the cross. His mother and a few others bury him in a rock tomb. Most of his closest followers had fled. Three days later, according to the Gospels, the women come to the tomb and find it empty. Jesus then begins appearing to his friends, and suddenly they come out of hiding, proclaiming that he is risen from the dead, resurrected. We asked so many people what they thought about resurrection. There's a wide range of opinion. The first question is even more basic. Was Jesus buried at all? Roman crucifixion, the purpose of crucifixion was state terrorism. And the function was to leave the body on the cross for the carrion crows and the, the prowling dogs. It, it was not simply that it made you suffer a lot. It meant that you didn't get buried. That's what made it one of the supreme Roman penalties, lack of burial. As I read those stories, I feel terribly sympathetic for the followers of Jesus because I hear hope there, not history. Some scholars think the resurrection stories were borrowed from Eastern pagan cults popular throughout the Roman world at the time called mystery religions. The conviction was in the mysteries that there is um, death and resurrection, just as crops go into the ground and die and come back again uh, for a new season in a wonderful kind of way. So also in human life, we go through a kind of death and resurrection. Well, hold it. You're saying that the mystery cults had an influence on the Jesus story because people who wrote the Jesus story took an earlier story and passed it on via Jesus? I, I believe so. One of the greatest difficulties that early Christians had if they were going to cope with the reality of the crucifixion of Jesus is what do you do with that? I mean, how do you keep the movement going? How do you have some hope in the face of this kind of shameful and horrible death? And one of the things I believe that early Christians did is they took the model of the mystery religions. They took that story and retold that story as the story of Jesus. But the mystery religions and their gods lost all credibility centuries ago. Not so with the resurrection of Jesus. His followers stuck to their story, even though they were persecuted. And as we know, the Jesus movement grew and flourished, which is why some eminent scholars believe there was indeed a resurrection. I simply cannot explain why Christianity began without it. I've already said there were many other messianic or would-be messianic movements mm -hmm. around in the first century. Routinely, they ended with the violent death of the founder. After that, what happens? The followers either all get killed as well, or if there are any of them left, they have a choice. They either quit the revolution, or they find themselves another messiah. We have examples of people doing both. If Jesus had died and stayed dead, they would either have given up the movement, or they would have found another Messiah. Something extraordinary happened which convinced them that Jesus was the Messiah. And over 300 years after Jesus' execution, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. 2,000 years later, Christians from all over the world venerate the place in Jerusalem where it is said Jesus rose from his tomb. I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historic evidence we have afterwards um, attest to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know as an historian that they must have seen something.
and even the most skeptical of scholars and historians agree on this. In his brief life, Jesus of Nazareth probably met and spoke with no more than a few thousand people. He wrote nothing. He commanded no great army. And he spent most of his time with the poor and the outcast. But he had a vision for a just world which was so vivid and which moved him so powerfully that he was willing to die for it. And after his death, his vision somehow transformed the world. Miraculous.